Hi, welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is an Agilent Field Fox or a Finalizer. This is model N9912A, a 4 GHz version. I think they also come in a 6 GHz version under the same model number. And this one apparently has been dropped and ever since it doesn't really quite work properly. And although I don't really see any damage on it, I'm not sure if that's really true. Perhaps something else has gone wrong with it. This is not to be mistaken with the Field Fox that I did an extensive review, which is a 50 GHz model. This is a B revision, and this thing is basically an entire RF lab that is portable. If you haven't seen the review of this, I highly recommend it. These are really extraordinary instrument. Now, this is a much lower model, but nonetheless, these are quite nice units. We'd like to take a look and see what's wrong with it, see if we can maybe fix it. Now, you may have already noticed that there is a message that keeps popping up on the screen. Now, that message really doesn't tell us anything. Hardware timeout could mean anything. But every once in a while, occasionally, another error. There you go. It actually happened just right now. This is ADC clock unlocked. And I think that error message is a far more useful message than the other one that keeps popping up. It's also really slow, but I think it basically hangs due to whatever error that's in there. So, for example, if I try to change the mode, and if I try to go to Spectrum Analyzer mode, it will take forever to launch the Spectrum Analyzer. It's just something is holding it back. So there's definitely something wrong with it. Like I said, I don't see any damage. Everything else looks good. But given that one error that we saw, we should look at the block diagram, see if that points us in anything meaningful. Well, we do have a block diagram that comes with a service manual, no schematic, of course, but that should be good enough to tell us a lot of information so we can take a quick look and see what we can find. Now, it's obvious that this instrument is made of several different assemblies and several different boards. That's not surprising. They separate these functions quite regularly. We do have a assembly A3, which is the front panel interface board. Looks like it has things like keyboards and speaker and so on. That's definitely not the problem, so we can ignore that. There's the LCD assembly that's working and the battery coming in that's obviously working because the instrument was running on battery. Now, if we pay close attention, we can see that the RF board, this is where the RF connections are connected to, as all the functions inside, including the synthesizers, the reflectometer and the preamp and the converters, I'll talk about that in just a second. But the actual ADC, is of interest because on the screen occasionally it would say that the ADC clock was not locked or it was lost and the ADC is right over here if you also pay close attention to that we can see that this is a triple channel digitizer however it is implemented it's not important but it's digitizing three things these three signals over here and these three signals from let's say port one are the incident and reflected waves coming from the reflectometer that's how you can measure S11 for example and then you do have another signal coming from the spectrum analyzer input, and that's how you can make a spectrum analyzer. So with three digitization channels, you can measure S11, S21, and you can measure a spectrum analyzer on the other port. You just cannot measure S22 and S21 because you don't have any other reflectometer on this one. This is a simplified front end of a network analyzer. All of that sounds great, but the clock of the ADC comes from a time base. And that time base is on the RF system. It's not on the RF board, it's on the system board. So that kind of makes sense also because the time base that is on the system board provides the clock to the data converter. That's the clock that supposedly has some issue. But it also provides another reference that goes into the RF board. And that reference appears to be 30 megahertz, interesting frequency choice. And probably that is used to lock all the synthesizers inside of the RF board. And therefore, you have your RF board and you have your digitizer all coherently locked to the same frequency and they're all kind of phase matched and time matched to each other, which is nice. Now, at the same time, you can see that the external reference also goes to the same time base. That also makes sense because if your time base is your master clock of the entire instrument, you want that to be locked to the external reference. And that should be 10 megahertz. So if this is 10 megahertz and we do have a 30 megahertz clock here, there must be some ratio to lock this 30 megahertz to that 10 megahertz. So yeah, quite interesting. There's also some board in here, which is probably the computer and some other interfaces. Nothing really interesting. So we should have an eye on this time base and see what the issue could be, because if this time base is gone, obviously the ADC doesn't work. The other error message that there was a hardware timeout or so is not that useful, but it's most likely related to the same thing, because if the ADC is not clocked or some master clock is missing, the instrument's probably not getting data from the converters and it's just timing out and it can't communicate. It could be related to that. The operating system is fully independently running on its own subsystem, so that's why it can continue doing stuff, even if this entire section at the top is not working. Well, I just realized there is a more detailed system board diagram, and there's actually a detailed RF board as well. Now this tells us even more information. So here's the ADC that you can see now that there are actually two ADCs. That makes more sense because a three-channel ADC would be a strange thing to make. But then there is a MUX over here, and that MUX is between the signals of the spectrum analyzer and one of the signals from the network analyzer. And that's because the instrument can never run simultaneously in spectrum analyzer and network analyzer mode, so there's no point having an additional ADC. You really either only use 
using either one of the channels or the two of them at the same time for the functions it supports. And there's some anti-aliasing filters and some other filters here in the front. And here's the 30 megahertz signal. The 30 megahertz signal is leaving that goes into the RF board. Time base is over here. And, and now it's obvious that it generates multiple copies of the same 30 megahertz signal. One here, one here, one here. And there's one that actually goes into the FPGA. And that also now maybe hints a little bit better at the hardware timeout because it looks like the FPGA reference clock is also coming from the same place. Interesting that these ADCs have a 30 megahertz reference clock. Perhaps they have their own internal synthesizers to lock to that because that frequency is clearly far too low. This is all boring stuff. Nothing to look at. But there's also the internals of the RF board. We may as well look at it since we're already here. But I think this is the first place we should pay attention to anyway. And we do have some block diagram for the RF board. We can take a look here and do some analysis as well. So here's our RF output port. This is where the incident signal leaves the instrument for making S parameter measurements and scalar measurements. You can feed that signal back into the RF input as well to measure things like gain. And there's also the RF input. You can use this as a spectrum analyzer as well, which is that's why this instrument is dual purpose. Now here's the 30 megahertz signal coming in, and it goes into a lot of different places. Now first, it goes all the way up here that is going to lock our source synthesizer, which can go from 100 kilohertz to 6.2 gigahertz, which is the entire coverage frequency of this instrument. And then it, it's in, it doesn't matter how it is built internally, some PLL. And then we do have some attenuation control to adjust the power. Here's our reflectometer. And here's the two mixers that create the reflected and incident wave. And if you look at the IF frequency, it's pretty low. It's only 290 kilohertz. I forgot that this instrument does not do any real-time capability. So therefore, it doesn't need a very high IF frequency. So perhaps that 30 megahertz is really the raw clock frequency of the ADC. It doesn't need that because it's such a low frequency. It's already quite a bit higher than this anyway. And then we have our LO synthesizer which should have the offset of 290. You can see that it does. It starts at 390 kilohertz and it goes up to 6.200290 gigahertz. That's going to produce the IFE one. So these two PLLs are locked to the ter same 30 megahertz. This 30 megahertz also comes over here. This is also used as the LO for the first converter, the highest frequency to down convert for the spectrum analyzer. The second and the third converters are running from the 30 megahertz as the reference, but clearly they have their own internal PLL as well as some VCO. There's a CPLD in there, temperature sensors and so on, pouring stuff down here. Yeah, the whole architecture of the instrument is now obvious, but the place we need to look at remains the same. It's the primary clock source. All right, so here's the first level of disassembly. I managed to get the whole thing apart and it's kind of not making sense. So this is our main board and this is that little computer assembly that was on top of it. This is what controls the display and everything. It's just a battery and there's some thermal material at the back that connects on both sides. The RF section is completely on the other side of this board. I will show you that closely in a second. And then we should be able to hopefully run this when it's kind of taken apart. We just have to put this at an angle because this has to be unplugged and we can run it from an, from an AC line. Now keep in mind when you look at this that this was designed in and distributed in 2008, 2009. So it's been a quite a while for this instrument and it looks still quite nice. Let's take a closer look. So the system board sits on top of the RF deck and I started taking a whole bunch of these screws off so we could separate them even further. There was also a cover here, which I suspect is where the synthesizer is. Although I don't see a lot of components on this side, must be on the other side. We do actually have, interestingly enough, a Vectron 30 megahertz, probably a TCXO, maybe some VCO of some kind here. That kind of makes sense. That matches the 30 megahertz we were talking about. So this must be some master clock into the PLL as well whole bunch of DC DC converters. Here's our main kind of processor digital board, all the IOs, and the reference is right over here as well, in close proximity to whatever is on the other side of this. So because the crystal is here, PLL must be here, external reference is here, ADCs must be on the other side of the board, and then all these little connections are the different signals that are going into the digitizer that must be running underneath, probably on the other side of this whole thing. So it just occurred to me, instead of taking it apart further, let's try and see if we can measure that 30 megahertz signal. Because that 30 megahertz signal appears to be on one of these connectors going to the other side. So we can just unplug it and measure our own. And if that 30 megahertz signal is coming out, we at least know that the synthesizer is working and it's generating the 30 megahertz. Perhaps there's something wrong with the ADC interface, but at least the synthesizer is there. That might be a better thing rather than trying to take the entire RF assembly apart. All right, I put it back together just enough so we could plug in the 30 megahertz coming out of the main system board. This is where it used to be plugged in, which goes into the bottom, which is the RF board. Let's see if the 30 megahertz is detectable here. And here's the output directly connected to the RTH 1004, and absolutely nothing is coming out. So there is no 30 megahertz being generated, at least on that port, from this instrument. That begins now to explain what's going on. So we do have a problem on our master clock. Now we need to take it apart a little bit more and see if we can trace down the problem. And I managed to take the board out, and on the other side of the board, 
we can find the rest of the components we were looking for. So are the FPGA, some of the drivers, USB interface, chipsets, and so on are there. And what I thought here was the synthesizer is actually where the ADCs are. This is a dual ADC, 16 or 14 bits, 40 mega sample per second maximum. So running at 30 megahertz kind of makes sense. And there's a whole bunch of really high-speed current feedback amplifiers that run most likely to distribute the signal. Now, a keen eye would have noticed that there is a cat on the table. Pooch, this is extremely unprofessional as I'm trying to record something, but I actually took out the Vectron TCXO. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to make sure this is actually working because I think this is directly connected to those buffer amplifiers and then ultimately to the output. I don't, couldn't see anything else in the way. And I thought that if you measure this in the circuit, a challenge would be, first of all, it would be difficult to reach because it's on the other side, but also if there's something shorted and it's bringing the output down, we would not know. These things can be quite complicated, but something happened when I was taking it out, so I'll show you what happened. But if you can measure this on its own, we can at least verify if the problem is in there or not. Well, as you can see, there is a pin missing from this oscillator. Now, when I was trying to unsolder this, there's a big ground plane in here, and the ground connection of this oscillator is connected to the body. And I was struggling trying to not apply too much heat, and then as I removed it, I noticed that this pin was still inside the PCB. Now, I don't know if I did that when I was kind of rough handling it a little bit, or it was perhaps bad from the factory and it was partially broken, and maybe it really did fell and eventually broke. So we don't know that, of course, unfortunately, but what, we, what I can do is, because this side is accessible now, I could apply an external 30 megahertz signal in its place because that's essentially what this is. And if that works, then at least we can come back and see if this is repairable, if it works or not, but that will eliminate one of the questions. All right, I soldered some cables into where the clock's supposed to go in, so now we can apply it externally. And well, check it out, I'm applying 30 megahertz, 12 dBm. It's not a 50 ohm load, of course, it doesn't matter, just enough swing into the instrument. And in the spectrum analyzer, it's sweeping. It looks like it's doing something. And if I turn the RF off, look, it stops because it lost the clock. So it doesn't sweep anymore. The FPGA stops working and eventually that error will pop up again. And if I start it again, there you go, it says ADC unlocked, and hopefully it will come back after some point. There you go, it's recovering. So yeah, that is a huge, huge step forward. It just means that there must have been something wrong with that TCXO module. So now let's turn our attention to that. And while we're in here, I'm sure you want to see the RF deck and at least have a quick analysis of what it's doing. This is the RF output port, and this is the RF input port. So this port is used for spectrum analyzers, and this port is used for generating an RF signal for the network analyzer function. Now, from the top-down view, you can immediately recognize the similarity here and here. And that's because this board has two synthesizers on it. We saw that in the block diagram as well. And these synthesizers are based on these ZCOM VCOs wrapped around a certain PLO. The details are not so important at the moment, just to recognize that we do have these two synthesizers. Now, they're not equally important in terms of their harmonic rejection. The one that's going into the multiple down conversion stages for the spectrum analyzer has to have very good harmonic rejection. And there are filter banks over here. Some of them are embedded, some of them are not. Underneath these little squares in between the layers, they're most certainly filters. And there are selection switches to select between them. There are multiple down conversion stages, which you can find all around the board. There are several mixers here. There are soft filters to filter out things like the IF between the various down converters so that you don't create an image between them, of course. There is, here's our, some Xilinx FPGA of some kind. There's another mixer here, there's another soft filter here. And the front end of the network analyzer is quite interesting. This component here is a variable attenuator. It makes sense. We even saw that in the block diagram because you want to be able to control the output amplitude. Now, there's a mystery component here, one gm one which is the classic Agilent component. And there is a Wilkinson divider here, which splits the signal into two, both of them going into this. And there's also the pass here for the attenuation. It looks like everything, the wisdom bridge, the mixers, and the low routing into the mixers are all handled inside of this one hybrid package. We have looked at these hybrid packages before under the microscope and looking at all the different dyes that are in there. If this were broken, I'd definitely look underneath this one because I think it's a pretty interesting concept where the mixers and the reflectometers and everything is under one component in one chip. It's really, really compact. Pretty interesting design. Uh, for sure. And the rest of it is nothing unusual. There's also nothing much on the other side, just a few components. This is all the RF magic. But we've x-rayed these kind of boards many times before and it's going to look exactly the same with a whole bunch of filters there. If you still want to see x-rays, just let me know and I can certainly do that. The rest of it are going to be selectors and switches, amplifiers, attenuators, blah blah blah. Nothing unusual. You can see these soft filters are so large here because this is again, remember it's from 2009, 2008. Technology has certainly changed and the quality factor can be achieved with other materials. You don't need these really high quality factor copper cores and everything anymore. Yeah, pretty cool. Let's put it back in the unit.
Well, I managed to take the lid off of this TCX, so it was not easy. In the process, I actually destroyed one of those other legs too, but that's okay, because I repaired it like this. We got the two wires going in with some insulator around it, and the two legs are now sticking out. If you look carefully, you can also see that there is indeed a crystal underneath this. Should be temperature compensated and everything. It looks quite good. Yeah, so hopefully this will still work. We have to first try it, and then we have to figure out how to build another case for it. All right, we have it connected, and check it out. It works. It produces a very nice sinusoid, 30 megahertz, and it's about 5 volt, 4.5 volt peak to peak. So we think we have repaired it, at least as far as um, the, the pins are concerned. So now we have to find a cage for it and put it back in the unit. And here's my little homemade shield. There are multiple layers of copper tape there, and I made sure that all the holes and everything are covered multiple times. The issue here is not for the clock to get out, because it's already next to DC-DC converters. It's more about things getting into it, which will then will show up in the entire clock distribution of the RF section. So shielding it is pretty important. And check it out, the unit's back together, and we're not getting any of those errors anymore. And more importantly, the in the cable analyzer portion, the return loss is sitting at 0 dB. I haven't properly calibrated it. But we can check to see if it's working very quickly by adding an attenuator to the RF port. And if that's working, we should see a very good return loss, and we do. There's a ripple in there, of course, because it's not calibrated, but indeed it is functional. And we can also switch the mode to the spectrum analyzer mode, like so. This is not the fastest instrument, but it does work. And on this side, I have set up a sweep, and we're going to run through the entire sweep by turning it on, and we should see the signal up here, there it is, look at that, it goes across, I've done a full review of this unit right over here, it's actually the previous video, so you should be able to find it, and check it out, look how nice it looks, it goes through the entire frequency range and it works just fine, so I think that was the entire problem, a little annoying to fix, but that critical message of the ADC being unlocked was the main pointer, without it it would have been quite a bit harder to find out what's actually gone wrong. As always, I hope you enjoyed this fix and repair. I know that repair videos are your favorite. As always, thanks to my Patreon supporters who make all of this possible. I'm very grateful for your support. I'll see you next time.